Rebecca. Investigators find a clue they think will lead to a killer's front door, but instead find themselves heading down a blind alley. Now their most important evidence is withering before their eyes. When a man reports his wife missing, her abandoned car becomes the biggest clue, but it's the nosy neighbors who drive the investigation. Four months into her marriage, a woman disappears, but when her body turns up, it's clear she was no runaway bride. Investigators must rely on flimsy evidence to bag her killer. For some lovers, marriage can be murder. Even though proving it may pose a challenge, killers can't divorce themselves from the consequences of their broken vows. morning hours of December 28, 1995, Melinda and David McLean let themselves Becky! into the apartment of their sister-in-law, Becky Vargas. The telephone and electricity in her unit hadn't been switched on yet. Rebecca? Becky was separating from her husband and had just rented the Ogden, Utah apartment. Becky? She had told her husband, Stephen Vargas, that she was going to try to start organizing her belongings and would return in an hour or two. But that was several hours ago. Stephen had asked Melinda and David to check on her, since they lived nearby. Melinda, who was Stephen's sister and Becky's best friend, was glad to go. Though they didn't see Becky, all seemed quiet and safe. leaving them unprepared for what they found. Becky Vargas lay dead in the leaves outside the building. Even before the sun was up, the Weber County, Utah Crime Scene Investigation Unit began its day processing the murder scene. The victim's blouse had been pulled up, At first glance, the condition of her clothes made her appear to be the victim of a random sexual homicide. But a closer look revealed the story was not so simple. Criminalist Russ Dean thought the scene might have been staged. It was as if her body had been moved from one location to another. Uh, her arm was under her body as if she'd been dragged. Her coat was removed and was under her body. The leaves were bunched up in certain locations around her arms and legs. And there was no other obvious indication of any type of sexual assault. In fact, though the victim had suffered a head injury, most of the blood had pooled at her feet, suggesting she'd been turned around. Whoever did this had apparently tried to throw off the investigators. The forensics team documented and collected a set of car keys, a cigarette lighter, fragments of blood-spattered leaves, and most significantly, the apparent murder weapon, a broken flashlight stained with blood and entangled with hair. They spent six hours sifting through every inch of the area before they were satisfied. They determined that although the body had been repositioned, the victim hadn't been moved far. The only blood found was just a few inches from where she lay. Because the blood-stained flashlight was the most compelling clue, it was analyzed first at the Utah State Crime Lab in Salt Lake City. Uh, 
Investigators could see that it had a partial fingerprint on it, stamped in blood. According to latent print examiner Scott Spute, a bloody fingerprint can be even better than a smoking gun. When we have a bloody fingerprint, for example, it's the victim's blood, it's not her finger, it's someone else's finger on the evidence. It's a crucial pinpointing item of evidence in which we can identify someone being at that crime scene, leaving that bloody fingerprint behind at the scene as they left. It would be bad practice to home in on that one print. The lab had to inspect the flashlight for additional prints. The obvious ones and the ones that remained invisible. It required two separate processes. Blood stains, because they're not oily, can flake or rub off. To fix them in place, the flashlight was heated to 100 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. After I heat it on, I then put a, a stain on there, which is called amido black, which reacts to the blood and makes it very visible and oftentimes brings out areas of blood that were invisible prior to treatment. To develop the latent or unseen prints, the flashlight was exposed to super glue vapor. The adhesive bonds to the moisture on the print, creating a durable shell that exposes and preserves it. Then, a fluorescent dye is applied, which adheres to the super glue. The latent prints shine under ultraviolet light. Testing revealed no other blood-stained prints. The original one, along with the latent prints, would have to do. Once a suspect was isolated, investigators were confident that the bloody fingerprint was all they'd need. While the clues were being scrutinized, Melinda McLean and her husband David went to the police station to give their statements. Melinda told police that she'd been best friends with Becky Vargas for 14 years. And then, and then we went back. Becky had been married to her brother, Stephen Vargas, for nine of them, but it looked like their marriage was coming to an end. As far as she knew, the split was amicable. Though Becky was having an affair that her husband, Stephen Vargas, may have suspected, there didn't seem to be a lot of tension between the couple. In fact, it was Stephen who had called the McLeans to look in on her after the police told him they had no officers available to check on his wife. David McLean, down the hall, told police a similar story. He said that Stephen Vargas had called him just before 11 p.m. the night before the murder. Uh, did Steve at all go over there? Stephen was worried because she was away so long. The apartment had no lights. He said that he and Melinda stopped by. Though Becky's car was in the driveway, there was no answer. They went to a window to see if everything was okay, but stopped when they heard moaning. Did you hear that? Yeah, she sounds busy. They thought that perhaps her boyfriend was there, so they left. They went to a payphone to tell Stephen that everything was fine. They told him what they had heard, then they left. David told police that, out of curiosity, they drove back to Becky's a short time later. Now they were surprised to see Stephen Vargas's Jeep parked out front. Soon he appeared from beside the building, got into the vehicle, and drove off. David said that they caught up with him. Stephen was wearing his bathrobe and slippers. He told them he wanted to check on Becky himself, but asked the McLeans not to tell anyone he was there. When David revealed this detail to the police, Melinda reluctantly admitted it was true. 
David told police that Stephen called them once more early the following morning. He said that Becky still wasn't home and asked them to check on her again. That's when they found her dead. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the lantern found at the scene wasn't the actual murder weapon, but it may have been used to subdue the victim. From the shape of the wound, she was apparently struck down with a hammer or something similar. No such object was located. The killer was clever enough to carry off or remove some of the most incriminating evidence. Authorities hoped he'd left enough behind. At the police station, investigators continued to talk with the McLeans. Their detailed story seemed to pivot on Stephen Vargas. Then it took a more provocative twist when the police dispatcher told Detective David Wheeloth that Vargas was on the phone, but he wasn't calling about his wife. She said that he was on the phone inquiring about his sister and his brother-in-law and if they were in fact at the police station. And I told the dispatcher, yeah, that's who we're, we're in here talking to. And if she would ask him if he would mind coming down to the police station as well. Separation. Police told him about um, Becky's murder and said army. that his in-laws were fine. Yeah, I was aware of but he might not and, be and because was, Melinda and David uh, saw him at the murder scene. Lot, no, I, I, he admitted that he was there that night, just as the McLeans had said. He peeked in the window, but he heard and saw nothing. Because the window was right next to where the victim was found, Wheeloth didn't believe him. If Steve had gone there to look and listen, uh, I don't think it would have been likely that he would have not seen Becky lying just a few feet away. His suspicious behavior and the eyewitness testimony by the McLeans was enough to get a warrant to search Stephen Vargas's Jeep and to collect his fingerprints and a blood sample. Can you, get a, uh, can you get a paper bag? Investigators were after anything that could link him to the crime scene. They found nothing but minuscule fragments of leaves, and not even many of those. Actually, I wish I could find my little The Jeep looked recently vacuumed. They collected what they could then returned the vehicle to Vargas and sent him home. The forensics team hoped they wouldn't need to rely on the leaves. Now that they had Vargas's fingerprint, they could compare it to the ones from the flashlight. Most of the prints did, in fact, match Stephen Vargas. But that made sense. He owned it. So the only one that really mattered was the one stamped in blood. The bloody fingerprint had a shape called a tented arch. Of the three features of fingerprints, loops, arches, and whorls, arches are the least common. And tented arches are rarer still. Only 5% of the population has them. Stephen Vargas was among that group. But the fingerprint on the flashlight wasn't clear enough to make a definitive comparison. Vargas might have left it, and then again, maybe not. I cannot say he did not leave that print behind. I can only say it's not enough to identify it positively. They thought the flashlight would illuminate the killer. Without it, their hopes of solving the case looked considerably more dim. Investigators working to solve the Becky Vargas homicide saw their most promising piece of evidence rendered useless. According to Detective Wheeloth, a case that had looked cut and dried now depended on very fragile clues. After we lost the flashlight, uh, about the last piece of, of physical evidence we had that we could try and do anything with were the leaf fragments that were recovered out of the Jeep. If investigators could find specks of blood on the tiny fragments, they would support the idea that Stephen Vargas was close enough to the body 
to attract them into his jeep. It fell to supervising criminalist Pilar Shortsleeve to analyze the minuscule samples. Trying to see blood on a small piece of colorful leaf was difficult. So we used a stereo zoom so we could get down and look very closely at the leaves and then um, to kind of guesstimate if we had any stains and then we would do some preliminary tests. Well, Out of the five samples of leaves, enough? Pilar Shortsleeve found traces of blood on two but she had no proof the blood was the victim's. She rushed the samples to a DNA lab for analysis, fearing it might already be too late. Whenever um, blood or body fluids are left on soil or, or samples that contain a lot of possible bacteria, the bacteria begin immediately in destroying the sample. Um, they destroy not only the cells, but they get into the DNA and start to break the DNA down. It would take three months for the results to come back from the lab. Investigators had to bide their time, but they didn't do it idly. They had to assume that the results would be negative and began to build their case some other way. Police served a warrant to search Vargas's apartment. They were after the bathrobe and slippers he was seen wearing at the crime scene. If he had beaten his wife to death, surely they'd be blood spattered. Vargas left the clothes in plain sight, easy to find. He was supposed to be wearing a bathrobe and a pair of slippers. The bathrobe had been freshly laundered. The slippers had no trace of debris on them. That in itself was strange, considering he admitted walking outdoors in them. It seemed like uh, Stephen Vargas was one step ahead of us on getting rid of any physical evidence that might link him to the crime scene. Uh, it seemed like every step that we thought of to locate that evidence was foiled. Robert? Yeah. But there was one clue he couldn't bury because it was 375 miles away in Cheyenne, Wyoming. After several weeks of wrestling with his conscience, Vargas's half-brother, Robert Esquivel, called police to tell of a favor that Stephen had asked before Becky's murder. Steve had asked him if he would come out here and kill Becky for him. Police set up a phone tap in Esquivel's apartment and had him call Vargas to get him to talk about their previous conversation. Steve had gone through this, this denying or not remembering that part of their conversation, that it had been a joke, and towards the end even got threatening. Though it stopped short of a confession, Vargas had said enough for police to arrest him on January 11, 1996, for the murder of Becky Vargas but they weren't sure they had enough evidence to convict him. One month later, the results of the DNA test on the blood-spattered leaves found in Stephen Vargas's Jeep came through. A comparison of the DNA from the blood on the leaves matched Becky Vargas's DNA. The blood on the blood fragments matched Rebecca Vargas. Now yes. authorities were confident of a conviction. Where are you going? Based on the evidence, police put together a likely scenario. Stephen Vargas, angry with his wife for her infidelity and their upcoming divorce, confronted her at her new apartment. They fought. It escalated. And he hit her with the flashlight her out. He moved her to the side of the house, thinking she was dead. He was wrong. He wanted someone else to find the body, so he asked the McLeans to check up on her. They mistook her death throes for the throes of passion. When they told Stephen, he returned to finish what he'd begun, using a more lethal weapon. Tiny fragments of leaves told the whole story.
Well, in this case in particular, we had this flashlight that had a possible fingerprint in it, in blood. And that would have been the piece of evidence that kind of closed all the loose ends, but it didn't happen. In this case, it was a very small piece of leaf that was found in a vehicle that had blood on it that came from the victim. And it was just the interesting and exciting part that something so small could be so integral in a case. Stephen Vargas was convicted of first-degree murder and is now serving 20 years to life. The case of Becky Vargas began with the discovery of her body. But when a person just disappears, it's not clear that a crime has even been committed. In this story, the names of the victim and the killer have been changed. On the morning of July 31st, 1987, Dan Remington of San Diego, California, was taking his kids to the YMCA. En route, he noticed his wife's abandoned car on the side of the road. Not wanting to alarm his children, he dropped them off at daycare, then rushed home to call the police. San Diego police dispatched an officer. On his way to Remington's house, he stopped to examine the vehicle. The car apparently had a flat tire. The doors were locked and he could see no spare, nor any sign of 29-year-old Liz Remington. When the officer arrived at the Remington's home, Dan Remington told him that he last saw his wife at 10.30 the previous night when she left for work. After he saw her car at 7.30, he called the hospital where she was a maternity nurse, but she hadn't shown up. Remington admitted that their 12-year marriage was rocky. They were discussing divorce, but hadn't filed the papers yet. I called around and made a couple of phone calls. You have to by chance have a key for the vehicle? Dan handed the officer a key to the car and granted permission to impound it in search of clues. While it was possible that Liz's disappearance could be logically explained, missing persons cases fell under the domain of the homicide unit. They had the skills to collect and preserve every piece of potential evidence found at the scene. Check the spare yet? They found nothing obvious to indicate foul play and towed the car to the police garage. Any overlooked clues would be preserved in case the car required a closer look. Detectives visited a nearby convenience store, thinking that Liz might have gone there after her tire went flat. The clerk told them that she had been in the night before. She needed to break a $20 bill to make a phone call. He didn't know who she called. Police remembered that Dan Remington told them she hadn't called home. It seemed reasonable to believe she may have simply run off with someone else. Liz's sister told police that was inconceivable. She wasn't the kind of woman who would run from a failing marriage. No matter how bad things became, she'd never leave her children. Sergeant Dennis Brugos of the San Diego Metro Task Force found that was the consensus. She was very devoted to her children and her family. She helped at school, she helped at Little League, 
and uh, just not the type of woman that would ever walk away from her family. Liz's sister told police it was strange that the spare tire was missing. Dan had changed the oil two weeks earlier and made a point of thoroughly checking the car, including the spare. Investigators took statements from the Remington's neighbors. Many spoke of the deteriorating relationship between Liz and Dan. The information was duly noted, but in terms of evidence that any crime had been committed, investigators had absolutely nothing. At the time of Liz Remington's disappearance, San Diego police were grappling with an apparent serial killer. Because there was no evidence that Remington had left against her will, these more violent crimes took priority. There was no body, there was no weapon, and therefore she was simply one of many missing adults throughout this county. And at that particular time, there was actually a series uh, of sorts that was going on where there was upwards of 40 women whose who were found murdered uh, in the East County area. So certainly that would have precedent over a missing person. Four years passed since Liz Remington's disappearance. Most of the murdered women were transients or prostitutes, so she was not considered one of the killer's victims. But when a task force was formed to look into the serial killings, her file came up too, and investigators realized she was still missing after all this time. The neighbors taped statements and the detective reports were dusted off. Well before Liz's disappearance, they had kept a close eye on the Remingtons and helped Liz out whenever they could. Over time, friction between the couple increased and neighbors grew concerned about her and the children. One even kept a log of what went on at the house after Liz disappeared. To demonstrate how the Remington's relationship had deteriorated, a neighbor told investigators about how Dan tried to sell Liz's car without her permission. According to the neighbor, Liz wasn't just surprised, she was furious. A huge fight ensued. He said that the only reason Dan didn't sell the vehicle was because Liz had the only key and wouldn't give it to him. But police recalled that on the day Liz disappeared, Dan had the key to her vehicle in his possession. Police also learned that neighbors had reported seeing Dan Remington filling in a ravine at the back of his property with a bulldozer shortly after Liz's disappearance. They said that after her disappearance, they saw him visit that part of the property every few days. He never ventured back there before she disappeared. Remarkably, because the case had never been officially closed, Liz's car had remained impounded all this time. Dan had sued to get it released, but lost. Technically, it was still considered evidence. Now it would be looked at more thoroughly. One of the first things investigators found were coins in the ashtray. Purportedly, Liz had been last seen by a convenience store clerk when she wanted change to make a phone call. The clerk's statement suggested she was okay. Now, investigators weren't so certain, since she had ample change in her car. They contacted the clerk to interview him again. That clerk at the convenience store uh, actually said he wasn't real sure that it was her. So that helped us to establish the fact that we didn't really know for sure whether she was there. Suspicions of foul play had been aroused.
Rugos wondered if the flat tire could have been staged. He sent the flattened tire from Liz's car to Goodyear Tire and Rubber in Akron, Ohio. Their lab is designed to evaluate the causes of tire failure. Here. The tire was examined on the rim. Report was the tire was flat, is still flat. There's definitely no Investigators found no outward signs of damage. Only a tiny puncture, which would have led to slow deflation. Once the leak was isolated, product analysis manager Chester Patterson took the tire off its mount and examined it more thoroughly. From the looks of it, the tire went flat after the car had stopped. We saw no damage on this tire. We saw no reason to have alerted any driver in the vehicle that something was going soft or, or whether the tire was deflating. Because in order to do that, you, the tire is beginning to come apart. And you would see that damage on the tire itself. And we saw no such damage. But he did see something he'd never seen in his 35 years experience. The tire removed from Liz Remington's car had been punctured from the inside out. This tire has been punctured from the inside. See these two impressions, circular impressions, right under the punctures of the tire. And we noticed the rust that's contained in them. And it told me that somebody had taken a nail and pounded it through the inside of the tire to cause that circular nail head impressions on the liner itself. He concluded that the tire had definitely been tampered with. Four years after Liz Remington's disappearance, investigators had enough to get a warrant to search Dan Remington's house. They found nothing of significance inside. Outside, a whole different story. In the yard, a police backhoe went to work excavating the filled-in ravine. Uh, the backhoe was probably two or three hours into the job when it hooked onto a piece of chain-link fence that was lying flat. Uh, the excavation slowed down. What we found underneath that chain-link fence was a tire. The tire was the missing tire from Liz's car. And underneath that tire, wrapped in sheets and blankets, was the body of a female. And a missing persons investigation became a murder case. Dan Remington was arrested and taken away. Officially, the body was considered a Jane Doe until a positive ID could be made. A forensic anthropologist determined the remains were those of a Caucasian female who had died of blunt trauma to the head. She had been in her late 20s to early 30s, about the same height as Liz Remington. It seemed like they had found what they were looking for, but the law required more proof than that. Forensic dentist Norman Sperber was called in. Everything hinged on the teeth. Teeth are the most durable part of the body, and we fortunately had dental films from her dentist. We were able to take films of her teeth because they were in very good condition. By comparing the shape and position of the victim's fillings and teeth with Liz Remington's dental records, Sperber was able to make a positive ID. Liz Remington had been found. Because the victim was discovered wrapped in bed linens, investigators believed that Dan killed her while she was napping before work. Afterward, he carried the body out to the ravine, buried it in a shallow grave, then rented the earth-moving equipment a short time later, piling on 8 to 12 feet of dirt. 
Then he drove to the scene and replaced the good tire with the one he had flattened. Next morning, he reported his wife missing, confident the police would never piece it together. His unwitting accomplice was a suspected serial killer who demanded all of the police department's resources. But the clues eventually resurfaced, exposing the crime. Though Remington's exact motive will never be known, Authorities believe he couldn't bear the shame of divorce or the fact that he'd lose half of his wealth and property. In October 1992, Dan Remington was found guilty of the first degree murder of his wife. He was sentenced to life without parole. Remington went to a great deal of trouble to hide his crime. Others take an easier approach which sometimes makes their crimes harder to solve. On September 21st, 1995, a body was discovered in a wooded area in Boise, Idaho. Plastic bags bound with duct tape encased the feet and head. state of decay, it had obviously been there several days. No ID was found. No attempt had been made to conceal the body. It appeared to have been hurriedly dumped there. Because of its position and wrappings, investigators couldn't even determine the victim's gender without disturbing an already disturbing scene. At this point, anything could be a clue, so the body wasn't unwrapped or inspected until it got to the morgue, where it was scrutinized under controlled conditions. Okay. The tape was carefully cut away, and the bags removed and preserved. The victim was female, around 60 years old. The coroner determined that she was strangled. She was most likely killed elsewhere, wrapped up, and transported to the woods where she was found. She fit the description of Wanda Kuzmachev, reported missing six days earlier. Wanda had been reported missing by her second husband, Ben Kuzmachev, when she failed to return from work. The couple had been married just four months. Both had retired from the large firm they worked for. Wanda took a job cleaning offices. You are beautiful. Thank you. Ben, a Russian immigrant who had once been artistic director for the Idaho Ballet, now worked for a security company. After Ben reported her missing, okay, detectives wondered if around. Wanda had had second thoughts about her second marriage and simply run off. But a check of her jewelry and possessions showed she'd taken nothing with her. That's never a good sign. And then her body turned up. The victim's car had not been found, so the bags she was wrapped in became the most important clue. Criminalist Cynthia Hill set to work examining them. It was all she had. Well, in this case, we didn't have a murder weapon. There were no eyewitnesses. And the place where Wanda was found was not the murder scene. So all these things were playing against us. Hill fumed the bags in superglue to bring out any fingerprints. The glue, contained in foil pouches, vaporizes and bonds to the print, preserving it. The print can then be dusted with powder to make it more visible. Then photographed to create a record. 
Hill found only one print on the bag around the victim's legs, but so far she had no one to compare it with. Ben Kuzmichev was called to the police station to provide a set of prints for comparison. In a murder investigation, it's standard procedure to get a spouse's prints. Usually, it eliminates the spouse as a suspect. In this case, that isn't quite how it worked out. The print on the bag matched Ben's. That didn't necessarily mean he'd had a hand in his wife's murder. If the bag had been taken from the victim's own car, Ben might have handled it prior to its use in the crime. The print was lifted from a portion of the bag where one would normally grab it. In terms of evidence, it wasn't enough. These people are living together. They're touching objects that one another uh, touch. Um, th you have to be able to find a fingerprint in a location where they wouldn't normally have touched, or it's in conjunction with another piece of evidence that puts them um, at the scene. Hill still believed that the bags might contain more prints. Though she didn't have the technology to lift them, she knew that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Crime Lab did. If prints were there, the Mounties could find them, or so she hoped. She carefully packed her bags, sent them to Canada, and awaited the results. While Cynthia Hill waited for her prints to come from Canada, investigators in Idaho found Wanda Kuzmachev's car. More than a week had passed since her body was discovered. The vehicle had been abandoned in a store parking lot four miles from where she was found. Police processed the vehicle for fingerprints. They raised two prints from the trunk lid. Their placement suggested they were left by the person closing the trunk. Inside, investigators found something surprising. Nothing at all. For Detective David Smith of the Boise, Idaho Police Department, that was a significant discovery. In talking with the family members, they said that she would always carry her Jehovah Witness literature in the trunk. In fact, they said you could not put anything in her trunk because it was so full. But the trunk wasn't entirely empty. Investigators found a single drop of blood. It belonged to the victim. Whoever had put her in the trunk had also left fingerprints on the gear shift knob. Prints on the trunk and on the gear shift matched Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators faced the same challenges as before. The car belonged to Ben's wife. It stood to reason that he could leave his fingerprints on it. Still, it seemed strange that his were the only clear prints found, especially since he told police that as far as he knew, Wanda was the last person to drive the vehicle. The evidence suggested that Ben drove it last, leaving behind the clearest prints. Tests were conducted to show that in approximately 70% of all cases, the last person who drives the car and, and activates the gear shift lever will destroy the person's prints who drove the car prior to and leave their prints on the gear shift lever. The prints made detectives 70% sure that Ben Kuzmichev was lying. That wasn't good enough. An inspection of the car seat disclosed another clue. I knew Wanda's stature in that she was five foot four and 140 pounds. When I looked at the seat, it appeared to me to be back farther than usual for a woman of that stature to be driving the vehicle. So I placed a female of five foot four, 140 pounds inside the vehicle. She was unable to reach the pedals, which appeared to be a comfortable driving position. Conversely, I put a male matching Ben's description, 5'11", 190 pounds into the driver's seat, and they fit very comfortable. The experiment provided more circumstantial proof that Ben was a liar, but it still didn't prove he was a murderer. 
By now, the Canadian Royal Mounted Police Lab had performed their tests on the trash bag used to wrap the body of Wanda Kuzmichev. The test, called vacuum metal deposition, is a state-of-the-art method for lifting difficult prints from plastic. The bag was placed in a vacuum chamber and then pelted with ions of gold, which cling to the plastic, but not to the oily prints. Then it's exposed to ionized zinc, which clings only to the gold, leaving the prints untouched and in contrast against the plastic. The process revealed a second print on the bag. According to Cynthia Hill, the position of this print was far more incriminating. The second uh, fingerprint that was developed using the vacuum metal deposition proved that he had a direct contact with that bag because the positioning of the hand was in such a way that he would be grabbing the plastic bag, wrapping the tape around Wanda, and he would be the only one that would be leaving the fingerprint in that position at that time. In most cases, that would be enough to win a conviction. But investigators weren't so sure. Proving a spousal murder on fingerprints alone would be a hard sell. The prints and other evidence they'd gathered gave them enough to get a search warrant for the Kuzmichev's home. They found no signs that this was the murder scene. But they did find the Jehovah's Witness literature that the victim's family said she never removed from her car. The items presented more circumstantial evidence that Ben had been involved in the murder. By January 1996, four months after the crime, investigators were still building their case against Ben Kuzmichev. Detective. He began to feel the circle of evidence closing in on him, and he announced he was going back to Russia. At that point, police had no choice but to charge him with Wanda's murder. If he returned to Russia, he'd be a free man beyond U.S. extradition. Though they had enough to arrest him, they weren't certain they had a solid case for murder in the first. Between the time of his arrest and the trial date, investigators continued to gather evidence against Kuzmichev. Under surveillance in jail, he couldn't make a move without authorities knowing about it. We placed monitoring devices on approximately 17 phones inside the jail at the Ada County Jail. Now, that gave us the ability to monitor his conversations as outgoing as well as whoever he was seeing as a visitor. Uh, the end result was that uh, we received nothing uh, that could be used in court. The, nothing incriminating came about the phone calls. But help came from an unlikely source. Kuzmichev had confided details of his crime to his cellmate. The prisoner, disturbed by Kuzmichev's lack of remorse, reported the details to authorities. He had nothing to gain by doing so. Ben and his cellmate were watching TV one evening when the news media broadcast that we had located a witness who had told us that she had, in fact, sold Ben duct tape and trash bags. The inmate told us that Ben found this humorous, that he had, in fact, purchased from this lady, but they were not the ones that we were looking for that he used in the crime. The inmate's information, though hearsay, provided one more strike against Ben Kuzmichev. Investigators realized they'd gathered all they were going to get. They weren't sure they had enough. But because Ben was likely to be released and flee to Russia, they had to take the case to trial. From what police could put together, four months after their marriage, Ben and Wanda's honeymoon was over. He had been dependent on her money, but wanted to return to his homeland. She refused to go. Their animosity built, and Ben strangled her. He wrapped her body in plastic bags, emptied the trunk of her car, loaded her in, and dumped her in the woods. Then he abandoned the car in the parking lot.
based on the accumulated evidence, Ben Kuzmichev was convicted for the second degree murder of his wife, Wanda, and sentenced to 21 years to life. For Detective David Smith, solving this case meant more than simply delivering justice. You do become personally involved. I mean, this guy has come into to your town, committed this heinous act, and now you have this grieving family that you want to do everything in your power to solve this case for. And that's how I personally take it, and I know any other seasoned uh, homicide detective will tell you the same thing. When spouse kills spouse, the clues are sometimes difficult to read. But the marriage of forensic science with good detective work can bring together what the killer had tried to put asunder. Police find a frozen body in the Arizona desert. The chilling discovery sends investigators searching for more victims. A small town, a brutal murder, and a killer who could be anywhere. When all leads are exhausted, the investigation focuses on a blurry surveillance photo. When a young mother disappears, detectives are left with few clues. But slowly, the evidence begins to point to a dangerous and twisted predator. A lack of clues may cool down a hot investigation, but there's no statute of limitations on murder. Months or even years may pass before forensics can spark a fire under these cold cases. Investigators from the Costa Mesa, California Police Department pulled up to an abandoned car on the Corona Del Mar Freeway. They were responding to a call regarding a missing person, Denise Huber, age 23. No one had seen or heard from her for almost 24 hours. And that wasn't like her. Denise's best friend had found her car on the side of the road while searching for her. Investigators examined it closely, but aside from a flat tire, nothing seemed amiss. The only personal article they found was a pair of pantyhose on the front seat. Denise preferred to drive without them. Though nothing in the car tipped investigators about what had happened, Detective Ron Smith concluded that Denise ran into trouble soon after she had pulled off the road. What struck us as unusual about the scene and concerned us right from the very beginning was that very near to her car, there were emergency call boxes, there were pay phones, there were all night convenience stores, none of which Denise went to to call her parents or to ask for help. We knew right away that something was amiss, something was wrong. The last person who saw Denise was her date from the night before. She had dropped him off after a concert. Denise never made it home. Bright, popular, just graduated from college, she wasn't the type to worry her parents by going off without a call or note. Her family and friends started to look for her the next morning. After recovering her car, the Costa Mesa police launched a massive search for Denise Huber. They notified law enforcement agencies across the country. They followed up every clue, every lead. Denise's friends and family put up posters and appeared on news programs begging for information. As the months and years passed, the tips dried up. But police kept Denise's case open 
and as active as they could. Every day we would do something with the Denise Huber case. We would review old leads. We'd go over old reports again. We'd look one more time at the photographs. Uh, we never gave up, even though we never really had anything good to work with. After three years, no one could tell her grieving family and friends what had happened to her. Denise Huber had simply vanished. Meanwhile, more than 300 miles away in Arizona's Prescott Valley, authorities were grappling with a mystery of their own. On July 9, 1994, a woman went to buy paint at the home of a man she met at a swap meet. Hello? While she waited for him, she noticed a padlocked rental truck and the paint and chemical cans cluttering his yard. She thought they looked out of place for such a respectable neighborhood and wondered if any laws were being broken. Suspicious, she called a friend who worked for the police. Her friend thought it sounded like a clandestine drug lab, which police find in the most unlikely spots. He sent investigators from the Yavapai County Sheriff's Department to check it out. The rental truck with the California tags looked like it hadn't been moved in months. The electrical cord snaking out of it and the paint cans all around reinforced the notion that this might be a mobile drug lab. A check of the tag showed the truck had been stolen. Armed with a warrant, police cautiously opened the cargo door. Inside was a freezer. Ready, guys, for opening up. Not knowing what it might contain, they suited up in protective gear. Plastic bags obscured the contents, but at the bottom of the freezer lay a pool of frozen blood. Carefully moving the bags aside, the officers expected to find nothing more than a deer. Instead, Lieutenant Scott Mesher uncovered a horrific mystery. Initially, when we opened the black bags and could tell that we had a human, a frozen body with handcuffs uh, behind the back, ice crystals, uh, it, it, was, it was grim. The homeowner still hadn't returned. So police ran the license plates on the white pickup, also parked in the driveway. The owner was identified as John Joseph Famolero. Within an hour, Famolero and his mother pulled up to the house. Sheriff's deputies took Famolero into custody, charging him with stealing the rental truck. They were anxious to find out more about the body in the freezer. Mrs. Famolaro, who lived next door, told detectives that her son was a house painter, which explained the paint cans. She said the truck had been parked there about two months. She didn't know anything about the freezer or its contents, except that the electricity in John's house had been turned off for one day, and he had asked to run a power cord from her house to the truck. At the police station, Famolaro was polite but uncooperative. He refused to answer any questions and asked to see his lawyer. Without any assistance from their suspect, investigators would have to rely on physical evidence at the scene to identify the body in the freezer and to find out how it got there. They charged Famolaro with homicide. The next day, warrant in hand, investigators entered Famolaro's house, hoping to find information about the victim in the freezer. In its frozen condition, they couldn't even discern the victim's gender. 
Look through these things on the chair. Famalaro's yeah. house was crammed with his belongings. This was the home of a man who never threw anything away. If clues were here, they'd be difficult to find. After more than two weeks of searching, investigators found several promising clues. The first was a set of handcuff keys that matched the cuffs on the victim. The next clue took investigators by surprise. Two complete Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department uniforms. In the garage, the deputies found two boxes marked Christmas, but there was nothing merry about them. Inside, officers found blood-stained women's clothing and a bloody hammer and nail puller. They also found a pair of women's shoes, the backs badly scuffed, as though the woman who wore them was dragged. Get a couple of bags here. Get a shot of this hammer. And that wasn't all. We did locate numerous female identifications. That included social security cards, I believe some driver's license, and other identification, uh, obviously raising the concern of maybe we had additional victims. Yavapai County Police had to face the very real possibility that John Famolero was a serial killer. Arizona investigators looking into a murder had every reason to believe that there may be more than one victim. To test that theory, investigators brought in cadaver dogs to locate more bodies on John Famolaro's property. The dogs, trained to detect the slightest whiff of decay, alerted their handlers several times. Officers dug up every spot and still found nothing but they never completely gave up the suspicion that the killer had struck before. I just got the paperwork from Costa Mesa. Police, Police followed up on every piece of ID found in the Christmas boxes. Much to their relief, they found that each woman was alive and accounted for, except one from Costa Mesa, California. Her name was Denise Huber. To confirm her ID, Yavapai County forensic technician Mike Winnie lifted a thumbprint from the thawing victim and compared it with the one printed on Denise Huber's California driver's license. The prints matched, identifying Huber as the victim. To authorities in Arizona, the name meant nothing. But to Costa Mesa detective Ron Smith, it was the news he had waited three anxious years to hear. The call I received from Lieutenant Scott Masher from Yavapai County was that he thought maybe he had a body identified as Denise Huber and asked us if we were familiar with Denise Huber. Well, of course, I almost fell out of my chair when he mentioned the name. Now that she had been found, investigators in Arizona had to determine how she had been killed. Working with the frozen and decomposed remains presented a unique set of challenges to Maricopa County Medical Examiner Ann Buholz. In our environment, to examine a frozen body is very unusual. We deal 99% of the time with people who have been exposed to heat elements, and that is more our area of expertise than someone who has been in a cold environment. It took the body approximately two days to thaw where we could actually perform the internal examination. On Friday, July 16, 1994, Yavapai Detective Scott Mesher and Costa Mesa Detective Ron Smith, along with other officers, gathered in the medical examiner's lab to observe the autopsy. The cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to the skull, resulting in multiple fractures. To identify the murder weapon, investigators needed to evaluate the entire skull 
to see where and how the blows had been struck. They called in forensic anthropologist Laura Fulginiti. How many days are we looking at here? Reconstructing a person's skull is very similar to doing a jigsaw puzzle. Essentially, you have about 50 pieces and you need to put them back into what you know to be the right composition. It took Fulginiti two days to reconstruct the skull, never losing sight of the fact that this victim was once a person. And I remember standing in this very room thinking to myself, how did you come to be in my sphere? This is not right. It's not natural for you to be here. She determined that the victim had sustained more than 35 blows to the head. The wounds were consistent with the hammer and nail puller pulled from the box in Famolaro's garage. To be certain, the lab ran tests. Technicians were able to establish a DNA profile from the blood residue on the nail puller. It matched the DNA profile taken of the victim's own blood. The match confirmed that they had found the murder weapon. To build their case, investigators had to retrace the events that led from the victim's abandoned car on a California freeway to John Famolaro's freezer in Arizona. It was very important for both agencies, the Avapai County Sheriff's Office and the Costa Mesa Police Department to work together and piece the evidence from California and Arizona to one case, one solid case, in order to successfully prosecute this. The Costa Mesa Police Department gathered information on Famolaro's activities during the time he lived in California. They learned that he had attended the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Reserve Academy, but he couldn't make the grade and dropped out after just a few weeks. He kept his uniforms, which police found at his house. Further investigation led detectives to a warehouse in Laguna Hills, 12 miles from where Denise Huber's empty car was found. John Famolaro had stored some paint and supplies in the warehouse, then moved everything out when he left the area in August 1992, 13 months after Denise Huber vanished. Investigators thought it was likely that Famolaro had committed the murder here. They hoped to recover forensic evidence that would tie the killer to the crime and determine where the killer's trial would take place. Police searched the unit for evidence of the crime, using luminol to expose traces of blood. Applied to a surface and viewed under an alternate light source, luminol reveals blood stains invisible to the naked eye, even traces left years earlier. We found that the warehouse was huge, uh, but I wanted every square inch luminol for blood. Almost the very last bottle in the very last corner that we looked, we sprayed luminol into the corner against the wall and all of a sudden, the luminol just lit up. This bright glow showed us we found what we were looking for. Technicians compared this blood to a sample taken from the victim in Arizona. They matched. The forensic analysis gave Detective Smith of the Costa Mesa Police the proof he needed to make the case. The forensic science in testing the blood was absolutely critical. Number one, it established that the crime occurred in California, and that established jurisdiction. It also positively identified that blood as Denise. It put Denise at that scene. Pomolero never confessed. The forensic evidence spoke for him. The investigators had successfully matched the blood in the California storage unit to the victim in Arizona and that placed the victim within deadly proximity of John Famolaro. Authorities believe that Huber pulled off the road with a flat tire. Spotting his prey, John Famolaro approached under the guise of lending a helping hand. He abducted Denise Huber in Costa Mesa, California, in 
the early morning of June 3, 1991. Pamelaro murdered her sometime later, hid her body in a freezer, trucked it to Arizona, and kept it until police discovered his crime three years later. John Famolero was sentenced to death. He awaits execution on California's death row. Famolero hid his crime by keeping the body close to him. Other killers are not so conniving, but they can be equally elusive. It was a December evening in 1990. Peggy Phillips wondered why her husband, Dean, was taking so long to lock up the launderette they owned in Ozona, Texas. It was just next door, but he'd been gone 20 minutes. She found him lying on the floor, bleeding and barely conscious. Police and paramedics raced to save him. Peggy thought that Dean must have fallen and hit his head. But the paramedics could see that this was no accident. Dean Phillips had been beaten nearly to death. Peggy watched as the paramedics loaded her husband into the ambulance. It was the last time she saw him alive. Dean Phillips died early the next morning, December 26th. The cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. Investigators determined that Phillips had interrupted a burglary and paid dearly for it. They found only one hard clue, a single fingerprint lifted from a coin box left on the floor. They sent the print to the Texas Department of Public Safety. Like small town police departments all over Texas, the Ozona police depended on the DPS crime lab for forensic services. This time, though, the Department of Public Safety came up empty. The coin box fingerprint didn't match anything they had on file. News of Dean Phillips's death spread through Ozona. Crockett County Chief Deputy Sheriff Alton Davis was determined to catch the criminal who had shattered the quiet of this little town. We've got a population of probably three to 4,000 people, so it's a small town. Uh, everybody knows everybody, and uh, it, was, it was a real shock to the community that something like this could happen in Ozona. The community stepped forward to help the investigation. <laughs> a witness reported seeing two local men wearing bloody clothes the night Phillips was killed. A warrant was obtained and their bloody clothes were confiscated before they had time to launder them. Brought in for questioning, the men claimed they were hunters and that the blood was from a deer they had poached. Investigators were skeptical until they got confirmation from the DPS crime lab. The blood was indeed from a deer. And the men's fingerprints didn't match the one lifted from the coin box at Phillips's laundry the case's first promising tip amounted to nothing. A clerk at a convenience store right off the interstate gave investigators their next lead. Got a couple minutes I can talk to you? Yes. A man came in an hour before the murder and asked where the laundrette was. And we're just checking the neighborhood. She described him as stocky with dirty blonde hair and a t-shirt with radio call letters. Oh, what time was that? He drove a beat-up blue van with a green door on the passenger side. Um, there may have been a passenger in the van. 
investigators hope to see the suspect on the store's surveillance tape. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. So you have a good evening. Thanks a lot. But the security camera was old. The man's face was a blur. Neither the DPS nor the FBI could enhance the image electronically. The investigators were convinced they had their suspect on this tape. But his image, like their chances of finding him, were dim. How are you doing today? As the investigation into the murder of Dean Phillips continued, witnesses reported seeing a strange blue van in town the night of the murder. Some thought they saw two people in it. Sheriff Alton Davis believed that Phillips's killer was a stranger just passing through town. I was on is right on Interstate 10, or more or less out in the middle of nowhere. This is the first one we've had where the someone has came off the interstate and murdered one of our local people. Investigators knew the killer was probably hundreds of miles away by now. And then they got the call. A van matching the one described by the witnesses was stopped about 200 miles west of town. Davis sped to the scene. Uh, we found an old uh, GMC van, light blue, that had a dark passenger door on it, uh, dark primer colored. And we took photographs of the van. Uh, we talked to the, there was a Hispanic male driving it, which didn't fit the description of our, our suspect. The case had run into another dead end. Reviewing the clues they'd gathered so far, investigators realized that all they had to go on was a blurry surveillance tape and a store clerk's okay, baiting recollection. They needed some way to turn these hazy clues into solid information. Then they recalled Karen Taylor, an experienced forensic artist with the Special Crimes Service of the Texas DPS. Taylor had worked with the Ozona police on missing persons cases. She is a pioneer in the forensic art and science of facial reconstruction, developing witnesses' vague descriptions into recognizable faces of criminal suspects. My function is to take some bit of information from a crime that occurs, produce some sort of a visual image that can be put out in the media, and hopefully it will trigger uh, additional information that can be used to connect the crime to the victim or connect the crime to the suspect. Ozona police sent Taylor stills taken from the videotape. But after she had evaluated the black and white photos, she wasn't sure she'd be able to help. So I had a look at those stills to see just what I could determine about the face. It was very blurry, the quality was, was pretty poor. So I could see that there wasn't much likelihood we could enhance that video electronically. And it would probably boil down to my trying to just do some sort of a, a sketch based on what I could see. Taylor knew that while every feature might not be rendered perfectly, the sketch's resemblance to the suspect would be strong enough to help the investigation. Well, after years of doing this, I've come to believe that the most important thing uh, to capture in a face for a forensic artist to trigger recognition is getting the proportions right. Each of the component parts in a face, each of the features, the eyes, nose, mouth, is important, but it's not as important as the arrangement of those features on a face. Taylor wasn't sure the image had enough information for her to work from. Then she noticed a feature she'd overlooked, the store clerk. She had talked with the suspect face to face. Taylor hoped the clerk might provide the missing details she needed to sharpen the picture. Using the uh, video stills, I prepared as much of a drawing as I could, maybe 85% uh, done, and then faxed it to the witness, um, got on the phone with her, and she was able to make some changes. She said she wanted me to make the eyes look light, make the lower face look more slim, uh, and I did that. We hung up, I, I spent about 15 minutes making those alterations, and then I refaxed it to her, and she checked it and said, yes, that's right. So I was able to get the benefit of, of her long distance input over the phone and, and uh, using the fax. Here he was, the most likely suspect in the murder of Dean Phillips. Here. 
the Crockett County Sheriff's Office prepared a crime bulletin. Karen Taylor's drawing of the suspect's face was circulated across the country and to every radio station where someone might recognize the call letters on the suspect's shirt. Taylor's drawing represented the investigation's last hope. But when all the publicity brought no response, the Dean Phillips murder case came to a dead halt. The beating death of Dean Phillips looked like it was destined to go unsolved. Sheriff Alton Davis and his team had exhausted their last leads. Uh, eventually, the, we'd, we'd ruled everybody out we were getting, and the, the lead stopped coming in, and we didn't have anything to work on. And it just more or less went cold, and we just had to sit until we got some other type of leads. Five years came and went without another clue or lead. But Peggy Phillips was determined to bring her husband's murderer to justice. She contacted a television crime show and asked if they'd run her story. In August 1996, just over five and a half years after Phillips was killed, the TV show aired the story of his murder and featured Karen Taylor's drawing. That's what got the phones ringing. From around the country, viewers called in leads. Texas Ranger Jerry Byrne fielded the calls and directed the investigation. One tip led him to Paul Wesley Taylor, a convict at Utah's minimum security prison in Draper. Ranger Byrne contacted Draper Prison and asked for Taylor's records and a photograph. When he saw it, Byrne felt that at last they had tracked down their suspect. The photograph of Paul Wesley Taylor was, was nearly identical to a composite drawing that a DPS artist had conducted back in 1991. Um, initially, I felt like it was too good to be true. Byrne sent Taylor's records and fingerprint card to the DPS. They matched Taylor's right ring finger with the coin box fingerprint. After years without progress, this was a giant step forward. Investigators went back to the original set of clues, looking for more connections to the suspect. They found out that Taylor's brother worked at a radio station with the call letters seen on Taylor's shirt. They were now certain Paul Wesley Taylor was involved with the murder of Dean Phillips. But they wanted to know about the van's passenger, a witness or possibly an accomplice to Phillips' murder. Taylor's arrest record showed that his girlfriend had been with him at the time of his arrest in Georgia. Georgia authorities located the woman. Her answers filled the remaining gaps in the case against Taylor. She told Ranger Byrne that they had traveled through Texas during December 1990 and that Taylor had pulled up outside of a laundrette and gone in. She saw him fighting and he returned to the van with blood on his shirt. And she certainly didn't know that anyone had been killed. He never said that he killed She led investigators to a field where Taylor had ditched his bloody clothes along with a stolen coin box. They now had a credible witness who placed Taylor in the laundrette at the time of the murder. Utah extradited Paul Wesley Taylor back to Texas. On September 15, 1998, nearly eight years after the killing, he pled guilty to the capital murder of Dean Phillips. On the 21st, he was sentenced to life in prison. Forensic artist Karen Taylor had turned a single blurry photograph into an image that helped unmask and apprehend a bald-faced killer. When that photograph and drawing were presented, they knew that it was Paul Wesley Taylor. That photograph and that composite drawing is what broke this case open. Investigators speculate that Paul Wesley Taylor got off the interstate in Ozona to get some food and gas. 
Short of money, Taylor got the idea to knock over the launderette after closing time. Dean Phillips was in the wrong place at the wrong time. In other cases, tragedy stalks its victims. August 16, 1989, Joe Gilbreth finished work and arrived at his home in Villanau, Georgia. He was looking forward to spending the evening with his baby girl, Amber, and his wife, Nikia. He noticed that his wife's car was gone. This was odd. Nikia was usually home fixing supper at this hour. When he went inside, he started to worry. Nikia would never let Amber Nikia. sit in her pajamas all day. And there was no way she'd ever leave the baby in the house by herself. The doors were unlocked and didn't look like they had been tampered with. When Nakia's family Nikia. told Joe they hadn't heard from her, he called the police. Nikia. The Walker County Sheriff's Department sent officers to investigate. Joe and his mother-in-law reported three missing items, a blue telephone cord that had been ripped from the wall, a bedspread that had a sheet stitched to one side, and all of Nakia's underwear. Based on what he found in the house, Detective Pat Bedford believed that Nakia Gilbreth's disappearance was more sinister than the simple missing persons case he was originally sent to investigate. My first impressions are, you know, she was taken out here bound. Uh, somebody forcibly was taking her from this residence. When you tie that into the, the fact that it was realized that a whole drawer full of her undergarments and lingerie was missing, it makes you think that we're dealing with another serious crime here. Checked around, see if there's anything missing by chance. Um, took shower. Joe Gilbreth told the police that the day had started like any other. I checked all the house and that The alarm went off at 5.30. Joe got up and got ready for work. Nakia went back to bed. And by 6 a.m., the house was quiet. Joe and the baby were the last to have seen Nakia. A squad car was stationed at the house in case she might return, but Nakia never came home. On August 18, 1989, the day after she had disappeared, the Walker County Sheriff's Department had little to go on. We got a tragedy here. We got we got a problem. Um, at first, no good leads to follow up on. Uh, her car had not been located. She had not been located. Uh, didn't appear to have any leads from talking to neighbors and uh, searching the immediate area. Uh, we had nothing at that point. But that soon changed when Nikia's mother found her daughter's car abandoned on a logging road half mile north of the Gilbreth house. Investigators hoped they'd find clues to help locate her. Technicians raised fingerprints all over the car, but they belonged to members of the Gilbreth family. Officers found indications of a second car parked next to Nakia's. It was an ominous sign, but the tire impression wasn't distinct enough to photograph or print. Nakia's mother noted that the baby quilt Nakia always kept in the back seat was missing. And that was it. Nothing at the scene offered a clue of what had happened to Nakia or where she might be now. Still, her family held out hope that she'd come back to them unharmed. 
Though investigators believed she was a victim of foul play, they had no evidence and no suspects. Joe had passed a polygraph indicating that he wasn't involved. All they had were a few missing items and an abandoned car, but still no sign of Nakia. Two days later, a boy collecting empty cans along the highway made a crucial, gruesome discovery. The body was too decomposed for a positive visual ID. Though it was a white female, about Nakia's size, with the clothes and jewelry Joe had described. Dental records confirmed everyone's worst fears. The autopsy determined that Nakia had died from asphyxiation. The examination also revealed marks around her wrists and ankles, marks that could have been made with telephone cord. But there was no other significant forensic evidence. No hairs or fibers, no fingerprints on the body. Nothing that might dictate the investigation's next step. Investigators considered a number of suspects, but none of them panned out. Leads dried up. The case went cold. Uh, unfortunately, we were going nowhere in the case. We had no good leads, no good suspects. Uh, any tips that we got, uh, we did everything from roadblocks, uh, car to car, house to house, door to door searches, uh, searched the area thoroughly. We weren't able to really locate anything that was helping us. Uh, several months went by and we really weren't making any progress in solving this case. And you cannot let something like this go on. Uh, you've got to be able to solve this case. Then, four months after Nakia Gilbreth disappeared, investigators heard about a similar case in nearby Gordon County. A young woman was abducted by an intruder while her child slept. For 14 hours, he forced her to model lingerie for him and assaulted her repeatedly. Then he brought her back home. Before police could identify the woman's assailant, the case took a bizarre turn. The investigation into the death of Nakia Gilbreth had led to a similar account of a woman's abduction. The connection was weak, but it was their only lead. Two days after the assault, the woman's father reported to police that he saw a strange man drop off a Christmas tree at her house. When investigators ran the truck's license plate, they discovered that it was registered to James Ray Ward. He worked for a nearby well drilling company. The woman picked out Ward's picture from a photo lineup. She recalled that during the day she was being held, she told her assailant that she hadn't had a chance to get her child a Christmas tree. Officers took Ward into custody a short time later. Ward pled guilty to rape and was just starting a 20-year prison term. In their check into his whereabouts prior to his arrest, Police learned that Ward had drilled a well at the Gilbreths a year earlier. Then he returned to check on it in July 1989, just a month before Nakia was killed. Ward's employer said that drillers were never sent back to check on wells. Ward had acted on his own. The similarities between the abduction of his rape victim and the abduction of Nakia Gilbreth provided police with their only lead. When officers searched the home Ward shared with his wife and children, they found a stash of women's undergarments that didn't belong to Ward's wife. Detectives also uncovered a receipt for well drilling made out to the Gilbreths. But it was much more than a receipt. Uh, had directions, the road name, uh, the mileage that would have led me right to the Gilbreth residence. Uh, the description of the victim he had written in there, 
uh, matched her description, uh, including an age of a, a daughter that the victim had. Then we had our first direct link from the murder to a suspect. Investigators also found items missing from the Gilbreths' home. A bathing suit bottom, a baby quilt, a bedspread, and a blue telephone cord. Got it. Phone cord. In order to build the strongest case against Ward, investigators needed to prove premeditation. They obtained a statement Ward had written regarding the abduction he'd pled guilty to. They wanted to compare this writing sample with the incriminating notes jotted on the Gilbreth's receipt found in his home. Document examiner Karen Scott performed the analysis. A handwriting comparison is basically a side-by-side -side comparison. I look for features in the writing of one set and I see if I find the same thing in the other set. And I'm looking for things like how the letters are on the piece of paper, how they're formed, how they're spaced. Scott looks for the idiosyncrasies, the little details that give a person's handwriting its individual character. For instance, the F in the word fine, it's very uh, short, the very, the very bottom of it. The D in the word road and side are written opposite the way people are taught, staff first and then the round part. While this is not in and of itself a unique just to this writer, it is not the way it was taught to be done. After comparing the note with Ward's known handwriting, Scott was confident that both documents were written by the same person. Investigators then examined the bedspread, quilt, and bathing suit bottom found in Ward's house. Nikia's mother supplied the matching top which she found in the Gilbreth's home. Because hundreds of identical bathing suits were manufactured and sold, the prosecution had to prove that the bottom found at Ward's and the top found at the Gilbreth's were parts of the same suit. To make that assessment, the lab had to compare the amount of fiber wear on both parts of the suit. They concluded that the bottom matched the top. The suit belonged to Nakia Gilbreth. The investigation turned to the other two items, the bedspread and the baby quilt. Before she even put them under a microscope, trace evidence technician Terry Santa Maria recognized their significance. I knew that these types of bedspreads did not come commercially from the manufacturer with a sheet sewn to it, so I knew that the item had been altered by somebody. After determining that, I then examined the baby quilt. When I pulled the baby quilt out, I immediately recognized that this was homemade. Santa Maria called Detective Bedford. These two items, the bedspread and the blanket, were absolutely unique, one-of-a-kind items. They were a direct link from the suspect's home back to the victim. This evidence completed the case against James Ray Ward. At Ward's trial, Nikia's mother-in-law testified that she had stitched the sheet onto the bedspread to cover the rough cloth and had sewn the baby quilt for her granddaughter. The only way that they could have come into Ward's possession was if he had gone into the Gilbreth home and Nikia's car and taken them. Ward never confessed. But based on the evidence, investigators pieced together a scenario for the murder. On the morning of August 17th, Ward watched Joe Gilbreth leave for work. When he saw it was safe, he entered the Gilbreth home and abducted Nakia. I believe he pulled the telephone wires and the cord away from the wall. I believe he bound her wrapped her in the quilt, and on the way out the door, I also took a drawer full of her underwear and lingerie as a trophy. Prosecutors called Ward a meticulous, organized stalker with a perverted mind. 
Investigators speculated that he fantasized that the women he was assaulting liked him. That might explain why he returned to place a Christmas tree at the door of one of his victims' homes. Jurors convicted him of murder. And in July 1991, after deliberating just three hours, he was sentenced to death for murdering Nakia Gilbreth. When the leads disappear and an investigation stalls, that doesn't mean a case is closed. In a homicide, investigators have an arsenal of forensic techniques and all the time in the world to catch the killer. Look at this. When a wealthy family is murdered in their home, it looks like a professional hit. Until investigators begin to suspect it was really the work of a gifted amateur. The investigation into the drowning death of a woman in Pennsylvania sends ripples out as far as North Carolina, where some dark secrets begin to surface. Detectives on the case of a murdered woman get more than they bargained for when they uncover a sinister family business. Every family has its problems. Every household has its secrets. But when the skeletons in the closet are real, forensics is called upon to get to the bottom of those family plots. On Easter Sunday, 1992, the Ewell family was wrapping up a weekend getaway at their beach house. Dana, a 20-year-old college student, bade farewell to his older sister Tiffany and his parents, Dale and Glee. Dana stayed behind to spend the evening with his girlfriend's family, while the others made the 200-mile trek back to Fresno. See you home. Have a nice flight. It was the last time Dana would see them alive. Two days later, when he couldn't get his family on the phone, Dana called a neighbor to check on the house. The neighbor, accompanied by the Ewell's housekeeper, made a gruesome discovery. Mr. Ewell lay dead on the floor. He appeared to have been shot in the back of the head. As investigators from the Fresno County Sheriff's Department searched the house, they realized that Dale wasn't the only victim. His daughter Tiffany and his wife Glee were also found dead. Like her father, Tiffany had been killed execution style, ambushed with a single bullet to the back of the head. But Glee had known what was coming. It seemed that she had tried to run before bullets to the back and shoulder stopped her. The gunpowder residue on her sweatshirt told investigators that the killer had then fired into her body at close range. Based the on the room. condition of the victims, right. the investigators room. knew that the Yules must have been killed oh. almost immediately after they returned from the beach two days earlier. Five spent slugs were collected from the crime scene. One more was found in Glee's body. In the master bedroom, investigators found an opened box of nine millimeter ammunition and an empty gun case. The owner's manual showed that the missing weapon was a Browning 9mm pistol. Since much of the house was ransacked, detectives first theorized that this was a burglary attempt gone awry. But the evidence didn't support that theory. No, looks like an amateur job. There was no forced entry. Many valuable items, including Dale Ewell's gun collection, were left in the home. Rather than use pillowcases to collect the loot, Bed sheets were laid out and loaded up with worthless Just items like down. audio cassettes and coins. To homicide detective John Souza, 
Even though the killers slipped in and out without notice, it just didn't look like a professional burglary. A good burglar searches uh, dressers and stuff by starting from the bottom and going up. That way he has never have to close a drawer. He opens the bottom one, he searches it, he opens the next one and they all stay open. Where well, here was a combination of everything. There was no pattern at all. The crime had been planned out to a T. Uh, Though many neighbors were in their backyards on Easter Sunday, no one noticed anything strange at the Yule house, nor had they heard gunshots. Given the amount of forethought that must have gone into the murders, detectives could not discount a professional hit. Nor could they overlook the prospect that someone might be coming back to finish Take off the sole family survivor, Dana Yule. He returned from school and met with investigators. If he feared for his life, he was hiding it, along with his grief. He's been just told that his family is dead, all his family. There's not a tear. And it just amazed me. I'm going, well, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he's in shock. He told police that his mother had once worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. His father, who owned an airplane dealership, had a reputation as a ruthless businessman. As Dale's $8 million fortune grew over the years, it seemed likely that he'd made some enemies. Investigators delved into the family's personal and financial background, probing for dark secrets. None were found. Glee's history as a translator with the CIA was uneventful, and though many people seemed to have disliked Dale Ewell, none had a motive to kill him and his family. What, what's this? Our lab Dana was asked to inspect the house, keeping an eye out for anything missing. As you can see, the blood stains here. But we're not sure whose blood that was. Uh -huh. Detectives noticed that he seemed unaffected by the blood-stained carpet. But he became indignant when he saw that investigators had damaged a whoa, light whoa, whoa, fixture. Whoa. What happened here? Did your people do this? Immediately after the funeral, he started spending money. He lavished his girlfriend with expensive gifts and purchased a $130,000 plane for himself. It was suspicious behavior, but Dana had an alibi. During the murder, he said, he'd been four hours away with his girlfriend's family. The girl's father, an FBI agent, confirmed it. Dana stood to gain millions of dollars from his family's death, but his perfect alibi meant that he couldn't have been the shooter. Detectives hoped that forensics would help find out who was. But there was little to go on, no footprints or fingerprints. Even the shells had been removed. The only physical evidence was the six nine-millimeter bullets expended at the crime scene. All hope of solving the case rested in the hands of ballistics experts at the Fresno County Sheriff's Department. The crime lab determined that the bullets had come from the box of ammunition found in the victim's nightstand. Identical scratch patterns told investigators that all six bullets had been fired through the same barrel. But when these marks were compared with ones from a Browning pistol like the one stolen from the Yule's house, investigators found an obvious discrepancy. The scratches that indicate rate of twist didn't match. Rate of twist is the distance it takes a bullet to complete a single rotation. The Browning has a rate of twist of 10 inches, but the murder bullets showed a 12-inch rate of twist. For criminalist Alan Boudreau, there was no mistaking the findings. To me, that finished the issue. It's not a Browning pistol that fired the murder bullets. But these weren't the only marks on the slugs. Each of the six bullets bore deep scratches. Boudreau was puzzled by these peculiar marks. I'd never really seen anything like that before, uh, although I had about uh, I don't know, 24, 25 years experience. 
Enlargements of the bullet markings were sent to law enforcement labs throughout the country, but none was familiar with the etchings or the unusual rate of twist. Six bullets had been fired, yet no one had heard shots. Unusual gun barrel marks had etched a mysterious signature onto the resulting slugs. This suggested that the weapon had been modified, perhaps by a silencer. But the sheriff's department had little experience with them. I've never come across where someone had used a silencer. Um, silencers are not, I mean, they're used and you see them on TV a lot, but I think it's more uh, movie drama than, than, uh, than actually in real life. Silencers are not, not used in crimes. And so that was, that was kind of unusual in itself. Before, Sousa had only theorized that murder was the motivation. If a silencer had been used, he now had the physical proof. You got a silencer, you got a killer that came to the house to kill people. That was the sole purpose. After their ballistics analysis, investigators studied the microscopic residue from Glee's sweatshirt. It's common to find gunmetal residue near close range shots, but this one contained an unusual mix of rubber, steel wool, and bright yellow fibers. The forensics team couldn't identify the source of these materials, but knew that they had somehow been used to modify the weapon. Their findings corroborated the silencer theory. They proved that on Easter night, someone had entered the Yule home with a deadly agenda. He ransacked the house to make it look like a burglary and stole the victim's gun to throw detectives off track. But he had used ammunition he found in the home. And that meant the killer would have had to know there was a box of 9mm ammunition stashed in Dale Ewell's nightstand. Only a handful of people had intimate knowledge of the house. And three of them were dead. Detectives probed more deeply into Dana's background. College classmates at Santa Clara described him as a preppy, clean-cut loner, obsessed with wealth. So it was odd, they thought, that he'd been best friends with a student named Joel Radovsich, who was nearly kicked out of school for stealing furniture. Joel seemed defensive with investigators. He told them that he barely knew Dana. His whereabouts on Easter Sunday you know could not be confirmed. It? Look, I already told y'all right now. I don't know anything about him. Surveillance on Dana showed that Joel moved into the Yule home two months after the murders and lived there until the following October. During that time, Dana paid his friend's bills and treated him to thousands of dollars worth of helicopter lessons. Yet when Dana was asked about Joel, he denied knowing him. Detectives had caught both young men in a bald-faced lie. They needed to find out what else they might be lying about. More than a year after the triple homicide of a wealthy Fresno family, detectives still didn't have enough evidence to prove that Dana Yule and Joel Radovsich were involved. And the pair was well aware of that fact. When Dana returned to Santa Clara the following spring, they communicated only through beepers and payphones. Dana was skilled at dodging the detectives. Dana was always looking over his shoulder, very cautious. Uh, he would go to the jet center in San Jose airport, and they had insulated booths, pay, payphone booths. And most of the calls were from those. And you, you couldn't even stand outside the booth and hear what was being said. Joel wasn't as careful. He was overheard telling Dana that he was worried about what the investigators might have on them. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough to tie the young men to the murders. Investigators obtained a search warrant for a duplicate beeper so that they could monitor Joel's pages. Weeks passed without any suspicious calls. Hey, find 
exactly what it is. Then, in October 1993, Joel got a page from a man detectives knew very little about. His name was Jack Ponce. Okay, there it is. He and Joel used to go target shooting together. Ponce admitted that just 11 days before the Ewell murders, he had purchased a Feather Industries 9mm semi-automatic rifle. He said he bought it to kill opossums. Detectives thought that was an odd choice of weapon, and when they asked to see it, Ponce said that the gun had been stolen. If investigators could somehow tie the missing rifle to the bullets and residue from the crime scene, they'd be able to connect Radovsic and Ewell to the triple homicide. Hans, realizing he was implicated in the murders, Luke. turned state's evidence. The magazine for he admitted that he'd purchased the rifle for Joel. So. Days later, Joel told Ponce he'd killed the Ewells and asked him to dispose of the weapon. Ponce threw it away. The murder weapon was gone, but another piece of the puzzle fell into place when investigators learned that Dana had purchased a book on how to build a homemade silencer. I purchased the same books that he did, he had purchased, and brought them home, and of course I gave them to Alan Boudreau and says, make a silencer per this book. Boudreau built a silencer to the book's specifications. Among the materials were tennis balls and steel wool, consistent with the residue found on Glee Yule's sweatshirt but the real proof was in the firing. For that, they'd need the gun. After interviewing 90 firearms manufacturers worldwide, investigators discovered that the rare Feather Industries rifle is the hey, only uh, nine millimeter manufactured with a 12 inch rate of twist. Even though he didn't have Ponce's rifle, Boudreau could still perform tests on other weapons of the same model. He spent months tracking down 9mm feathers with serial numbers close to the one registered to Ponce. The barrels of these guns would be nearly identical. Boudreau test fired the weapons through sticky paper to trap any microscopic particles blown through the barrel. This trace evidence was compared to the residue found on Glee Yule's clothing. The unusual yellow fibers, the rubber particles, and the steel wool were an exact match. And it was not difficult to reasonably conclude, yes, there, there is um, tennis ball material on Mrs. Yule's sweatshirt, and it's consistent with the silencer that I constructed based on the information from Detective Souza. The test bullets closely matched the characteristics of the murder bullets. The rate of twist was correct. The deep scratches were nearly identical to the murder bullets. And finally, the gun extruded the same residue as was found near Glee Yule. No other type of weapon could have matched so closely. In March 1995, nearly two years after the murders, arrest warrants were obtained for Dana Yule and Joel Radovsic. Here's the plan. Based on their extensive right investigation, detectives had Dad, finally pieced together the whole story. Don't forget, Hungry for his father's fortune, Dana conspired with Joel a year in advance to shoot his family and make it look like a burglary. In exchange, Dana would split the $8 million inheritance with him. While Dana established his perfect alibi 200 miles away, Joel slipped into the Ewell home with a spare key. He shot Dana's sister and mother first, then waited for Dale. They'd figured that without the weapon, they couldn't be tied to the murders. But as cleverly as they planned, Dana and Joel's designs weren't bulletproof. Neither man ever confessed. 
In May of 1998, Yule and Radovsich were found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. In the Yule case, creeping suspicions undermined a tight-lipped conspiracy. Elsewhere, a murder investigation was triggered by an innocent comment. Allegheny County, 911, what's your On November 7, 1994, police in Pennsylvania responded to a 911 call from a distraught man named Timothy Boskowski. Calm down, sir. Calm down. What's your address? Lee, we got a detail in Ross Township. It's a white female found in a hot tub. His wife, Marianne, had lost consciousness in the hot tub. He couldn't resuscitate her. Police arrived to see paramedics attempting to revive her. What happened this evening? Their efforts okay. failed. Is she going to be OK? Look, I was inside. She was out here in the hot tub, and I saw her, and I just. Her heart stopped as she was rushed to the hospital. The 35-year-old woman was pronounced dead on arrival. She had a 0.22 concentration of alcohol in her bloodstream. I'm sure you do, yeah, I, I do appreciate it. More than twice the legal yeah, limit for drank. intoxication. Did, were you aware that my wife drank? Boskowski told the nurse that Marianne had been a heavy drinker and that he blamed the drowning on her alcoholism. You got it? In Allegheny County, Cases of accidental death are police matters, so technicians processed the scene. Investigators questioned Boskowski's parents, who'd been called over to babysit while Timothy was at the hospital. Okay, well, it's a shock. It's really a shock. Boskowski's father made the comment that this wasn't the first time their son had endured such a tragedy. His first wife, Elaine, had died four years earlier, nearly to the day. When Boskowski returned from the hospital, investigators were waiting for him. Boskowski described the incident. Throughout the day and into the evening, he estimated that Marianne drank between 13 and 15 cans of beer. Around 11.30 that night, the couple downed a bottle of wine. Marianne was an alcoholic, her husband said. Boskowski claimed that Marianne stayed in the hot tub after he got out. When he next saw her, he said, she was lying on her side in the water. Detectives searched the house. They found beer in the refrigerator and a bin of empty cans. But these cans were completely dry inside and had obviously been collected over several days. Cans that had been opened that evening would have still held some liquid. The evidence contradicted Boskowski's claim that Marianne had consumed beer after beer well into the evening. They also learned that a friend of Marianne's had spoken to her on the telephone for an hour and a half earlier that afternoon. The friend said that Marianne didn't seem drunk. The more detectives learned, the more they suspected that Mrs. Boskowski's death was no accident, but a case of deadly deja vu. If Marianne Boskowski was murdered in her hot tub, Detectives in Pennsylvania had very little physical evidence to prove it. There was no sign of violence found in or around the tub. All they really had were some conflicting statements. Timothy Boskowski agreed to go down to the police station for further questioning. To Detective Jimmy Svetting, his exacting account seemed staged. One of the things he was so consistent with his times, too consistent. 10 to 1, I did this. Uh, Marianne did this at 8 minutes to 1. 
five after one, I was putting on my shoes. This interview with you this afternoon, is that okay? While Baskowski was relating his story, detectives observed a scratch on his neck. Could you tell me how you got that? My wife and I went on a cruise and I... They asked him to remove his shirt. Take a look at this. We may even want to take a picture of On his back, they saw a pattern of scratches. Boskowski explained that he and Marianne had been on a cruise recently. While in the tub, he had asked her to scratch his sunburned back. Given the suspect's pale skin and the deep gouges, the explanation seemed implausible. Uh, okay, that's uh, some scratches there, Tim. These looked like marks from a struggle. When investigators questioned Boskowski about his first wife, his demeanor drastically changed. No, I'd rather not discuss that at all, that's right. He cut the interview short and demanded a lawyer. Without enough information to detain him, he was free to go. Investigators immediately contacted law enforcement in Greensboro, North Carolina, where Boskowski and his first wife had lived. They uncovered some uncanny similarities between the two Mrs. Baskowskis. <laughs> Baskowski had met both wives, Mary Ann and Elaine, in church singles groups. Okay, you looked at this already? Yeah. Okay. I looked at it. All right. I thought she was. Yeah, she both she worked as religious school teachers. Uh, yeah. They were the exact same weight. Even more chilling were the similarities between their deaths. According to North Carolina police, Boskowski had called 911 on a Sunday night in November, just as he had done in Pennsylvania. Paramedics arrived to find Elaine on the bathroom floor with her husband attempting CPR. Okay, so we're here. Let me ask you a few questions about what happened last night. Sure. Boskowski claimed that his wife had been drinking heavily that evening, so, fell uh, unconscious so in the tub, in there, and drowned. Yeah. Do you know where, where, where okay. when you're listening to music, was that on a tape? Or Though detectives in North Carolina were suspicious, they didn't have enough evidence to disprove the husband's account. So you perform CPR? Yeah. Cause of death was left blank on the death certificate. Boskowski was never charged. I tried to get him to stop, but I mean, you know. Now, four years later, detectives in Pennsylvania were faced with the possibility that their case would end the same way. To bring it to a trial, you need more than just suspicion. You need, you need a case. You've got to put the evidence together, and everything has to be there. And they just didn't have what they needed. Though the bizarre circumstances of his wife's drowning deaths pointed to foul play, it would be a challenge for investigators in Pennsylvania to differentiate an accident from a murder, especially when there were no witnesses. Unless Marianne's body had a compelling story to tell, Boskowski would have just washed his hands of another suspicious death. The autopsy began with an inspection of the body there was no evidence of external trauma, just a few fresh bruises. But the bruising wasn't enough to disprove Baskowski's story. The paramedics might have caused them. The body was next examined for signs of drowning. To Allegheny County Coroner Cyril Wett, it was evident that something had cut off Mary Ann's breathing, but it wasn't water. These lungs were not wet and heavy at all. And if she had drowned in this tub, I believe that uh, there certainly would have been a fair amount of water into the lungs. The victim had sustained hemorrhages in her eye and the back of her tongue. The muscle tissue of her neck had sustained deep bruising. All of these were telltale signs of death by strangulation. The coroner concluded that after a rough struggle, someone had wrapped his hands around the victim's neck and squeezed the life out of her. The findings in Pennsylvania caught the attention of John Butts, chief medical examiner of North Carolina. 
He wondered if Baskowski's first wife, Elaine, had also been asphyxiated four years earlier. The autopsy reports showed no indication that she was, but the original examiner might have missed the telltale signs, enabling Baskowski to get away with murder. Elaine's body had been long buried, but photographs remained. Investigators hoped they'd be enough to rectify a grave oversight. Four years after Elaine Baskowski died in her bathroom, investigators in North Carolina finally had their chance to prove that she'd been murdered. Medical examiner John Butts noticed a strange mark on one of the photographs taken at her autopsy. One of the important uh, pieces uh, in the puzzle of this case uh, involved some uh, distinctive bruises that were present on Ms. Boskowski's uh, lower uh, chest, upper abdominal region. This was the set of uh, linear or elongated bruises that are illustrated in this photograph. These parallel bruises, called railroad tracks, match the shower door railing in the Boskowski's bathroom. At autopsy, their significance was overlooked. But knowing how Timothy Boskowski had allegedly killed his second wife helped Butts find clues to the death of his first one. She was literally squeezed to death. This bruise was produced when this woman's uh, abdomen, upper chest region, was pushed or compressed down uh, onto the shower uh, track. And again, it was, it was our, our feeling or our conclusion that that's actually the mechanism of her death. Based on what North Carolina investigators had turned up, detectives in Pennsylvania looked for more similarities between the two cases. They learned that both of Boskowski's wives were planning to leave the marriage. Neither had yet canceled their life insurance policy that named their husband as beneficiary. It seemed Boskowski felt that killing his wife would solve his financial and romantic problems. When history began to repeat itself with Marianne, he resorted to a plan that worked in the past. Thanks to the astute work of investigators in North Carolina and Pennsylvania, the staged drowning of his second wife would be Boskowski's last. In 1996, he was convicted of the murder of Elaine. In 1999, he was sentenced to death for the murder of Marianne. Timothy Boskowski's murderous past eventually caught up with him. In New Jersey, police again would have to look backward to solve a death in the family. Early Saturday, March 4, 1995, a jogger was having a run through East Side Park while most of Patterson, New Jersey still slept. One of its residents had apparently chosen to sleep practically on the jogging path. Hey buddy, you all right? Only a pair of feet stuck out of the sleeping bag. The jogger wondered how the person could breathe <gasps> and realized the occupant wasn't breathing at all. Police confirmed that the body in the bag was deceased. They interviewed the jogger and fanned out to look for evidence of a possible homicide. The victim was a young female, 18 to 24. She'd been beaten. The sleeping bag interior was bloodstained, but not soaked, suggesting she was stuffed into it afterward, probably to move her to this spot. Detective Mike Casseri led the investigation. We knew it was a murder. We knew uh, that wasn't the original scene. Um, it was just that we were uh, trying to figure out who did it, and that's where the whole thing started. Most every homicide investigation begins with the victim. In this case, she had no identity. The cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. The medical examiner found no sign of sexual assault. 
The blood-stained portions of her clothes were carefully cut away and the blood tested against the victim's own. If some of it didn't match, investigators hoped that it could be used against a suspected culprit. But all the stains matched the victim's blood. They found neither hide nor hair of any potential suspect. At the New Jersey State Identification Bureau, the victim's fingerprints were run through APHIS, the Automated Fingerprint Identification System. It compares prints from police files all over the country. Within hours, it found a match right in New Jersey. The victim was 18-year-old Tara Carter. Her prints were on file because she had once been arrested for shoplifting. Her parents had moved out of state, but police found her closest relative, her sister. They brought a photo of the victim. See if you see anybody recognized. A friend came to help because she couldn't bring herself to look at it. Yeah, I Together, recognize him. they made the ID. Now there was no doubt sure? Tara Carter was dead. Police learned that Tara said she was going to spend the weekend with her boyfriend. He went by the name Original. She didn't know his real name or where to find him. She also said that Tara had been living with a family friend, a widow named Celestine Payne and her children. They might know more. Payne lived in a nearby neighborhood where she occasionally rented rooms in her house. Police paid her a visit. Celestine offered to help in any way that she could. She directed us to the bedroom area where, where Tara slept with her two daughters. And uh, myself and Detective Reyes looked around. You know, it's common to look for phone books or anything with possible, uh, you know, names of friends or anything, because we had nothing. We didn't have anything to go on to solve this crime at that point. Oh, no. Wendy. <laughs> Tara Carter was treated like a member of Payne's family. She was the best friend of Celestine's daughter, Wendy, with whom she shared the room until Wendy moved to South Carolina. Detectives looked in the closet where Tara kept her belongings. They found nothing to indicate she was in any kind of trouble with her mysterious boyfriend or with anyone else. When Payne could offer no new information about the victim's boyfriend, Original, police put the word out that they needed to speak with him. In the meantime, they looked for more information about the victim. Payne directed them to the basement, where more of Tara's things were stored. You know, I think Tara told me. I yeah. They didn't know what they were looking for until they found it. In one area, drops of blood dotted the basement floor. Detective Reyes automatically told Miss Payne not to touch anything, you know, that it's possible that the crime happened here. And she uh, again said, well, if it happened here, I want to know about it. This is my house. See these drops right here? The amount and position of Did the blood droplets picture? raised suspicions, but didn't suggest that this was the murder scene. Investigators weren't sure what the drops meant. And you could see a, a dripping stain coming down from the rafter, directly below it was uh, a stain, a stain of blood, which indicated that it's possible blood may have dripped from the upstairs into the basement. Celestine Payne gave her consent to a more thorough search of her house. She said, I want to know about it. Whatever it takes to figure out, you guys do what you got to do. While the forensics team was dispatched, detectives continued their investigation. They headed back to the victim's closet, which turned out to be directly over the blood-stained beams. They found blood on the wall and floor of the closet, along with blood-stained women's underwear and other garments. It looked like bloody murder, but investigators had to be sure. Can you hand me the club up, please? Samples were collected and sent to the New Jersey State Police Central Lab where genetic markers in the blood were scrutinized. These proteins, inherited from our parents, don't change. Though not as precise as DNA testing, genetic marker testing is often sufficient 
because certain markers are more rare than others. Senior forensic scientist Cynthia McSweeney analyzed the samples from the closet. And I was able to determine that this blood stain was consistent with only 3% of the black population. That 3% included the victim, Tara Carter. The evidence proved that she had met her death inside the house. Well, we just got a few questions. Celestine yeah. Payne accompanied detectives to the station for questioning. Yeah, she nice. told them that she last saw the victim at 11 a.m. on Friday, March 3rd, the day before her body was found. Tara said she was going to run errands. Celestine and her son had errands of their own to run and were gone most of the day. How did it get out in the backyard? When Celestine returned, a man named Charlie Pincham was waiting on the porch. Pincham used to date Celestine's daughter, Wendy, before she moved away. And he was in the habit of stopping by Celestine's house and hanging out. She didn't know where he lived. Because he might have committed the crime while the Paynes were away, Charlie Pincham's name was added to the suspect's list. While Celestine answered questions, investigators combed her house for more clues. Besides the bedroom closet, traces of blood were found in the kitchen. The drain pipes were removed and the traps emptied to see what might have accumulated there. Almost 100 articles of evidence from there, including uh, blood drippings, uh, swabbings, took the sink apart and removed, uh, later turned out to be um, skull fragments inside the sink trap, the toilet. There was uh, some hair and, and matter found inside there. From there, the whole thing exploded. Uh, the investigation took off. By now, the victim's boyfriend, Original, heard police were looking for him and presented himself, along with an alibi. He was off the suspect's list, at least for now. That left the equally mysterious Charlie Pincham and the grieving Celestine Payne. But detectives didn't know where Charlie Pincham was, and the forensic evidence didn't necessarily place Celestine Payne at the scene when the murder occurred. This wasn't the first time police had been to Payne's house. While reviewing the case, Detective Sergeant Ronald Humphrey remembered a prior incident. There was a, a guy stabbed maybe about a year, year and a half before that. Uh, Eugene Cooper. I remember Eugene living there, but I never got to interview him. He was in intensive care unit at the hospital on a stab wound, and we couldn't get to speak to him. Upon Cooper's release from the hospital, he refused to press charges and disappeared. Now, 18 months later, detectives tracked Eugene Cooper down to see if there was a connection. Cooper told them that while he lived in the house, Celestine wanted him to sign his life insurance policy over to her. He didn't do it, but let on that he had. Soon after, Charlie Pincham attacked him. He said that uh, by the time he got stabbed, Charlie was the one that stabbed him, and uh, Celestine Payne had put him up to it. Cooper didn't go to the police because he was frightened and wanted to put the whole ugly incident behind him. He picked out Pincham's photo from some mug shots. Because Cooper implicated him in this stabbing, it was more important than ever to locate him. Now that Eugene Cooper was talking, he had a lot more to say. And the case took another unexpected twist. He told police that Celestine had set several fires at her house for the insurance money. He also admitted that he helped Celestine move a body but it wasn't the body of Tara Carter. Tara Carter had been found dead in a sleeping bag, and the investigation into her murder began to disclose other skeletons in Celestine Payne's closet. Hey, According to Eugene Cooper, the death of Celestine's husband, Alfonso, years earlier may not have been accidental. Prior to his death, Alfonso Payne had been suffering from severe hypertension and gout. He was being cared for by his wife, Celestine. 
In 1991, his body was found in a field across town. At the time, Alfonso's death was considered to be accidental, that he was doing drugs, wandered away, and collapsed. Now, three and a half years later, Eugene Cooper told New Jersey police that he'd helped Celestine and her children dump Alfonso Payne's body on the other side of town. With Cooper's new information, detectives pulled Alfonso's medical records and autopsy report. They found that before his death, he had been too ill to even get out of bed, let alone get across town. The autopsy showed that the drugs in his system at the time of death weren't those prescribed for his medical condition, but high dosages of five kinds of tranquilizers and antidepressants, all prescribed for Celestine. Hey, can you look the bed up? Yeah, sure. Investigators had enough to get another search warrant for Payne's home. They found that besides the policy on her husband, Alfonso, and for fire damage, Payne also managed to get one on Eugene Cooper, even without his signature. It appeared that Celestine Payne may have killed her husband, and once again, insurance seemed to be the motive. They also found a policy on Tara Carter's life. Looks like a couple of insurance This was strange, because like Cooper, she wasn't related to Payne. The policy provided a possible motive, Eugene Cooper, I don't but not enough evidence name. to arrest Celestine for murder. You the right to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. By this time, Charlie Pincham had been found and arrested for stabbing Eugene okay. Cooper. Awesome. Eventually, he admitted to it, saying that Celestine Payne put okay. him up to it. Okay. Then, investigators asked him what He's he knew man. about the Tara Carter I know murder. What's going on your he said he was there and tried to stop it, but Celestine Payne yeah, killed her. That's the only I'm doing. I'm Afterward, he admitted helping her move the body using a car the she rented. The they had what they needed to arrest Celestine Payne. Then they tracked down the rental car. Cynthia McSweeney tested the trunk for traces of blood and found nothing. But her job wasn't finished. Her tests of the liner below the trunk carpet yielded different results. When I analyzed the liner and did get a positive result, I began to think that perhaps the person had tried to clean up the area but had not done a thorough job. As before, a genetic marker analysis of the blood proved it belonged to the victim, Tara Carter. Its presence in the trunk of a car rented by Celestine Payne linked the suspect to the crime. You've got a pretty good racket. Despite the evidence, she flatly denied any wrongdoing. I, I know he lied. Like he many women who no, killed, no, no, she hoped her charm him, could mask her guilt. Detective Michael Casseri didn't buy it. Celestine was a devious woman. Um, she would look at you and say, child, uh, I didn't do this murder, and almost melt into you. You know, I had nothing to do with this. I would never hurt anybody. And, and she's using her kids to kill people, including her own father. She's killing her friends. She's killing family people. She is a, uh, she's evil. That's the only one word to put, an evil woman. She passed that evil on to her daughter. Investigators learned that while Wendy pretended to be Tara's best friend, she also pretended to be Tara at least long enough to sign a life insurance policy in Tara Carter's name. Oh, yeah. Once the policy was in effect, Tara Carter's days were numbered. The unwitting victim, lured into a false sense of security in Payne's home, was marked for death. You look pretty. It came quickly. Pincham admitted using a crowbar. Her body was stashed in the upstairs closet until it could be bundled and moved safely without being detected. Ultimately, 
The forensics clinched the case, and even Celestine Payne couldn't deny it. The bloodstains, the financial motive, and the opportunity all pointed to Payne, her daughter Wendy, and Charlie Pincham. When faced with the evidence, they plea bargained. Celestine Payne and Charlie Pincham received life, and Wendy Payne received 28 years. To solve some homicides, investigators need look no further than the victim's own home. But just because a suspect is a relative doesn't mean the case will be solved with relative ease. A killer in the home will take greater care to cover his tracks. It's up to forensics to make sure that deadly secrets don't stay buried in family plots.